you very much. So welcome everyone. Uh, so I'm a researcher with uh, INRIA and the uh, L'Oréal Laboratory in uh, Nancy. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm not going to show you so many pictures uh, of uh, you know, paintings and nice photographs. Uh, I'm going to show you actually 3D objects. And uh, I have a few of them with me, unfortunately not the best ones, because we give so many of these talks and they're all, all over the place. So I don't know, like I couldn't find the ones I wanted to bring, but I, I brought some. So we're going to talk about how to create these kind of objects. And uh, these are real uh, objects that came out of our 3D printers. And if you're familiar with um, manufacturing technologies, uh, doing this kind of uh, shapes in any other way than 3D printing would be extremely difficult. Uh, if you use a milling machine, you have uh, the tool has to access inside the part, and doing a foam-like structure like this is impossible. If you use molding, you might be able to do some very complex things with um, um, technologies where the mold is actually destroyed once the part is done, but even that wouldn't, wouldn't really uh, produce foams like that. And the interest in these uh, parts here is that uh, you want to make parts which are very lightweight, which are porous, maybe there's a fluid that can go through, even air can be used as a coolant, for instance, but at the same time, you want these parts to be very rigid uh, and to be rigid enough for the application scenario, right? Rigid doesn't mean anything if you, if you don't know with respect to what, right? So, uh, here, for instance, you can see these little bars. They're going to um, be uh, very good at uh, getting the charges around the, uh, the gear. And uh, this, hopefully, uh, will, will perform better than the parts that would be full while being uh, lighter. And that's important if you send stuff to space, for instance, and other things like that. So if you're not familiar with 3D printing, let me just give you a quick, uh, a quick refresher. Um, actually, we talk more about additive manufacturing as opposed to 3D printing. The reason is that 3D printing actually refers to one of these technologies. And so in, in the uh, academy and industry, we talk about additive manufacturing. This is this idea that you're going to generate the parts by adding progressively material to them, as opposed to removing material from an initial block. And let me show you one of these machines. I mean, I just took a random picture from, from the internet. And this is uh, what is called a selective laser sintering machine. This is one of the most used uh, technology right now in, uh, in the industry. It is not by far the only one. There's, there's a lot, a lot of varieties. But let, let me describe this one uh, uh, briefly. So this, this machine is essentially uh, oven. If you open uh, this machine and you take a side view of it, the Z uh, is the build direction, and uh, I'm only showing the x-axis here. What you have inside is actually a bed that can move up and down, right? So here the bed is down. And this uh, tank is actually filled with powder. And this powder is like, is like flour, just, uh, you know, this is uh, plastic or metal flour, so don't, don't try to uh, cook with it. Uh, and so the, the uh, reason I put them in sort of a layer fashion is that because this is the way the machine uh, functions. Um, it's equipped with a laser and with mirrors that can very quickly and very precisely uh, rotate. And so the way the part is being uh, uh, produced is by uh, putting a layer of powder lighting up the laser, having the laser beam go uh, along vector passes on top of the bed, and this solidifies the uh, plastic powder, right? And so when you have done that, you have done one layer of the part, and of course, what happens is that the bed goes down, we bring back one layer of powder, and we just resume the process, okay? And so at the end of the day, that means after several long hours of doing this, you get the part, and you can notice that there is a little catch here. It's, it's buried into unfused powder. Right? And when I say infused, it's not exactly the reality because, because this is a oven. It's heated just below the fusing point, which means it's actually a, a bit hardened. Right? So it's very hard to remove this powder. So if you have this view that 3D printing is push a button, get your part done, well, you're in for a surprise because now you have to vacuum clean this thing, and you know, it's going to take a long time and, and be quite a pain. Other technologies have other advantages or, or inconvenience. Um, another interesting thing is we can already see one of the geometric constraints here. If you have powder trapped inside, you can't remove it. Okay, and some of these, uh, of course, this goes against making lightweight subjects, so you better leave a hole, but there's also a, a safety issue because some of these powders are not good for health, right? So you better take them out because if your part breaks, it's going to be a problem. So what we are trying to do in our team is to do this kind of, um, of uh, what's called um, meta-material, right? This is the idea that, and you see this on the left in particular, this is this idea that even though you're using a single material for fabrication, you can change the shape of this material at such a small scale when you deposit it that you can trigger different behaviors than the one of the initial material. For instance, you can make the part more or less flexible or more or less porous. Uh, and this is captured in this idea of architectural material or, or meta-materials, there's different names for this. And of course, ultimately, what we want is to be able to mimic nature. This is a, a cutout of a bone. And you can see inside what is called the trabecular structures. You can see how they nicely 
align with uh, stresses in the bone, but at the same time are porous, so that cells can live inside. And a, this is a huge promise of additive matchmaking to be able to manufacture prosthesis, which are exactly like this, so that once implanted, cells can live inside. Um, so that's not what we are doing directly, but we want to do the algorithm that will power this kind of approaches. And so what's the difficulty with this? I mean, why is this not solved? Because the, machine, the machines, after all, seems to be able to do that. The prime is how do you model these things, right? Because when you model that first, it's a lot of details. So if you use a standard modeling tool, you'll have to assemble all these details. This is a very painful process. Second, you have manufacturing constraints. 3D printers are not magic. They cannot, they can, there are things they cannot do, and I'm, I'm going to talk about this later. Uh, and that's going to be a problem for some of these cases. And third, you better know what will happen once the part is fabricated, right? These are not just random details, right? I mean, I'm going to argue they can be random to some extent, but, but they have to globally behave in a specific way, right? And so it's very hard for a human uh, engineer or designer to predict this kind of behaviors as is or her or she is, sorry, modeling these details. Okay? So actually, we, ca we come from computer graphics originally, and when we saw this problem, we're like, wait a sec, this resembles this problem that we have in computer graphics, which is we want to make these super realistic uh, um, uh, images. Uh, this is taken out from a real-time uh, video game, and we want them to be full of details, and there's just too much detail to do by hand, and we have techniques to do this kind of stuff in computer graphics. So maybe there's something here that we can actually reuse. Right? And by details here, I'm referring to the tree trunk details, uh, you know, the leaves, uh, all the little, uh, like the gravel on, on the ground, and so on. These are not geometry, actually, these are images. So in a sense, what we wanted to do is to find ways to be able to author a structure. I would like a nice way to turn this, you know, bunny, why not, into uh, this grid-like surface that can exist in the physical world that will not collapse and not be too fragile. So how can I do this? And of course, doing it by hand, sorry, doing it by hand is out of the question. So we turn to texture synthesis, which is this nice problem where you give a pattern as input and you get more of the same uh, through an algorithm uh, and more of the same being defined as you want all the little neighborhoods in the output to look close to at least one of the neighborhoods in the input, right? And if you do that at all scales for all colors, uh, you assume, you expect you're going to get um, a result which is visually similar. And this is because we, are, we have a Markov random field assumption that this is going to work uh, at all scales. And we have nice algorithms to do that. You can cast an optimization problem or, you know, like uh, there are tons of, of techniques uh, for this. So how can we do this? But we want to do this with structures. Now we're going to input an image which tells us white is solid, black is empty, and please do some magic, put this pattern onto the subject and make sure that it is uh, structure, structurally sound. So how can you do this? I'm going to describe one of the techniques uh, we, we came up with, not all of them, but just to uh, give you an idea of how this works. So basically what we are looking at is to be able to define a mechanical problem. This is what you have in the middle. This is a bridge problem. You have two attachment points at the bottom, bottom left, bottom right, and then you, you want to support this uh, top thing. And we want the algorithm to optimize for a shape that is uh, the most rigid shape possible given some amount of material, right? This is what you have in black here. The domain is a rectangle, and in black this is the material used. But at the same time, we want this shape to somehow resemble at a local scale, the input we give to the algorithm, right? And so hopefully it will produce something like this. So how can we do that? Can we do uh, this kind of things? The first step is to define the local uh, geometry objective. And this one is actually very similar to what we do in, by example, texture synthesis. We're optimizing a shape. So this objective function is defined on the shape omega, and here it's illustrated uh, uh, on the bottom right. And at the bottom left, you have the example, which is describing the local geometry of these neighborhoods. So what we're going to ask is we're going to consider neighborhoods in the shape being optimized. And for each neighborhood, we're going to search in the example shape which one is the, best cur the current best match for this neighborhood. All right? And we're going to do this globally to define an objective, which tells us that if the objective is small, it means that every neighborhood in omega is close to one neighborhood in x, which means it's going to be locally similar, which is what we want to achieve. I'm not saying about the global shape. Because the global shape, I want it to be optimized by rigidity. I'm just talking about the local arrangement of material. All right, and this is a pretty bad objective to solve for. I mean, there's the you know, nearest um, best match search in there. There's a mean. It's not going to be nice, but we have techniques uh, from computer graphics to do that. And so we're going to rely uh, on them. And then we want to consider structural properties. We want to make a rigid shape. So what does it mean? In our scenario, it means that we have a current shape, omega in blue. And there's a weight somewhere, and this weight is going to generate forces, these are external forces, onto the shape. 
And these forces will trigger a displacement onto the shape. This displacement can be very small, right? Uh, and usually we consider only small displacements by doing linear uh, mechanics. And we can compute this displacement field using the finite element method, for instance, right? And this gives us a displacement. U of G, this is a displacement due to the external forces onto the shape. And then we can define something which is, which is classical, which is the compliance of the system, and this is how much the forces deform the current shape, and it's computed as the integral of the dot product between the forces and the displacement they generate, right? It's, it's the work exerted by the forces onto the shape, right? And this com the compliance intuitively in the inverse of rigidity. If you minimize compliance, you maximize rigidity. Keep in mind this is global rigidity, right? That's important. Um, uh, I'll come back to it later. Okay, and actually there are uh, well-known methods to do this. This is nothing new. Uh, and uh, this, this um, set of techniques uh, are called topology optimization. Uh, and so the idea is you give a mechanical problem, you have a domain, the rectangle, you give some percentage of material to the algorithm. That's important because if you ask the algorithm, make me the most rigid shape without giving a material budget, it's just going to fill everything full, right? Because, you know, the solid rectangle is the most rigid. We are ignoring the, the weight of the structure itself in this discussion, right? Um, and so you give it some amount of material, and this is how it looks. And what it does is that it's actually following the gradient of this um, compliance objective, which is properly defined, and, and you, can, you can solve for it. The only problem is you have to solve for the finite element uh, solution at every iteration of your optimization, so it's a bit expensive. Okay? If you're interested, there's a great starting point, which is this uh, super paper by Old Sigmund explaining it with a, a code 99 lines of MATLAB. Pretty, pretty cool. And I, I did a C++ version, which is not as elegant, but you know, if you do C++ and not MATLAB like, like me, it can be useful. So the challenge is how do we combine these two objectives? And uh, I'm not going to you know, uh, argue um, uh, very long for this, but, but basically the most you know, simple thing to do is to do some uh, linear combination of both, and please don't do that, this doesn't work, right? I mean, I can, I can tell you more, but it's just Im impossible. Well, it's possible, but it's, it's horrible to find a, a different lambda for every possible objective and every possible example and so on. It makes no sense, right? So we don't do this. Instead, we propose the simple modification of the problem where Local geometry is an objective, and um, rigidity is actually a constraint because that's your objective. That's the main thing you want. The main thing you want is, I want this bridge to not collapse, right? But the question is, how do you set up the constraint? Well, for this, we solve for the most rigid shape uh, that can be obtained without the uh, local uh, arrangement uh, objective. And this gives us the Cmax value, which is the best the algorithm could do. And then we need to relax it. We have to relax it. Because this is the best the algorithm could do. If we don't relax it, it has no freedom to do anything else, right? And we're going to relax it by some amount, let's say 20%, and then we get these shapes here, um, which are, I would say, a reasonable compromise between the local arrangement you wanted and the uh, global rigidity of the system. Again, we know this is no more than 20% less rigid than the uh, prior ones. Just a word of warning, when you optimize for compliance, you optimize for rigidity globally. It doesn't mean that you don't have a local concentration of stress that would rupture material, for instance, but this is a known issue with a global compliance method, and there are techniques to not do that, but, but of course the problem is you have to minimize for a max, and you know, again, uh, this is uh, difficult to achieve, but there are methods. Okay, just to give you an idea, so here we just took some uh, interesting uh, example, and we uh, solved for what is known as a shelf problem. You have an attachment at the bottom right, and then some shelves to support. And you can see the trade-off that is achieved if you relax rigidity, the rigidity constraints more, you get more of the appearance, but the shape is less and less rigid. And if you give more volume, you can get a similar effect. In this case, uh, um, the rigidity is preserved, but it's going to use the additional material to enforce more of the appearance, okay? So what can you do with this? Well, you can do design, for instance, where you, know, you can customize an arbitrary number of tables with an arbitrary number of patterns while knowing that this is going to stand properly, hopefully. And <laughs> here you can solve for chair problems, for instance, where you interleave several 2D problems to generate a 3D texture, so uh, a 3D structure, sorry. This is really 3D, it's just the optimization domains are interleaved 2D plates. Okay, and why we do that? Because, I'm going to explain later, but uh, this is too expensive to solve really in 3D. And this is some of the chairs you can build. I don't have the real one, big one, but uh, you know, I wish we could do it somehow. This is just laser cut. Code is available, so if you are interested in this, uh, you can definitely check it out, and contributions are welcome. The main problem is this does not scale. 
Because our intent was, you know, we're going to take a sample of a bone, a fabricular structure, and we're going to optimize for it in an actual bone to do a prosthesis, and it's just total overkill. Since then, some, some researchers have come up with very efficient schemes, in particular in uh, TU Munich. Um, uh, Jun Wu and colleagues have come, come up with nice ways to do high resolution topology optimization, so that possibly could be combined with this, but it's still extremely heavy uh, to compute. So we wanted to take a completely different point of view and to say maybe it's unreasonable to try to optimize fine scale structures into a global large scale problem, and maybe we can do better, and this is what I'm going to explain now. So what, what we want to reach is things which are like foams in nature, and these things are extremely detailed. If you take the foam on the right, I don't know the exact scale of this, but the porosity is probably in tens of microns in objects which can be tens of centimeters. So that's just a lot, right? And there's, there's no reasonable way you're going to be able to, to simulate and optimize for this in a, in a gradient descent loop. Or if there is, it's going to be so expensive that your application better justify it, right? So the challenge is, if you look at this, um, if you take a step back, the challenge is, first, we need a way to represent this thing that is memory efficient. Because we generated this little sample of foam here, and it's like, a, I don't remember exactly, a few cubic centimeters. It's already four gigabytes of triangle mesh. It's just unreasonable to store this at a triangle mesh. And on top of it, this was a, a very poor triangle mesh, right? The cylinders were not very well captured. Whatever you do, you have to consider manufacturing constraints, right? So for instance, we don't want to create pockets, but there are other problems, like you cannot go below some thickness because you're, you know, solidifying along this laser beam. It has a width to it which is really 40 microns, and you, you can't go lower than that. And also, you need to know what you're doing, mechanically speaking, right? Because otherwise, it makes little sense. You're just going to do random things. Um, it turns out that to address these challenges, actually, there's already a very nice uh, method, which is to use periodic tilings. And the idea of a periodic tiling is to take a representative volume element. Here, this is a simple cube minus a sphere. You see several of them here in the middle. And to stuff them in a periodic grid and intersect them with your object, okay? And this is very efficient in terms of uh, data structure representation. Uh, in this case, the little piece of code you see at the bottom is actually doing this in real time, uh, and so it's memory efficient. But what's more is that there's also a nice way to simulate for this. There's a theory known as homogenization, which uh, will help let you study the average behavior of your heterogeneous structure. So intuitively what this does is this takes this um, representative volume element assumes it's uh, repeated infinitely in a periodic domain, and it's going to compute the parameters of an equivalent homogeneous material, basically the piece of rubber that has the same global behavior, right? So this works only on average, which means you have to assume you have enough of the structure, but under this uh, situation, which is what we want, right? Fine scale structures in, in uh, reasonable scale objects, uh, it's going to work fine. And this lets you completely uh, forget about the fine scale details. So that's great, and there's a ton of prior art on this, which is, of course, highly relevant, but there are a few drawbacks. And so what are these drawbacks? The first one is, very often, we want, to, um, we want the, the little bricks we're repeating to conform with the surface, because otherwise, when you cut the boundary of this repeated grid, you're in for trouble, right? You're, you have things that will disconnect, you don't exactly know what's gonna happen, and so on. So we'd like this to follow the surface. But the problem is making a grid follow an arbitrary surface is actually a surprisingly difficult problem. Well, surprisingly, I don't know, but it is a difficult problem. And we should know because we have colleagues who are among the best experts in this field. And you know, they spend years and years of research. They have excellent techniques to do this now. Uh, but it's hard to do, right? And it's quite expensive. And on top of it, uh, as far as I know, nobody exactly knows, even if you have this, because the cubes are deformed, these are general exagerable elements. Nobody exactly knows how this impacts the mechanical response, right? And so that's, that's not direct to use. So ideally, we would like to not have to do that, even though it makes perfect sense to try. Um, the other thing is often you want to grade these materials, right? It's not about just making a, a sponge which has some average response, because we know how to do that already with uh, mechanical uh, processes. It's about being able to vary this in space, right? And varying means you can vary response in orientation, uh, and in different locations. And if you want to vary in a grid, what you have to do is to change the representative volume element in different, in different places of the grid. But the problem then is you have boundary issues because these elements may not be uh, compatible in terms of geometry. And that's also hard to, uh, to solve for. So the question was, can we completely avoid that? Because after all, if you look at natural foams, none of them seem to have representative volume elements or things that are somehow tiled, right? So um, for us, there was another possible way to do this, okay? 
And again, we turn back to computer graphics and say, let's look a little bit how we do complexity in computer graphics because we, you know, this is something that is a, 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 a big issue in computer graphics since the early days. In fact, in the early days, you could do this kind of pictures, okay, great, but there was absolutely no detail on them. And one of the reasons is these computers had extremely little memory. I'm talking about computers in the 1980s, right? And they had very small memory. So few memory that the actual frame would not fit in memory. It was generated as the uh, electron beam was going onto the screen, right? And so some researchers, and in particular Perlin, but, but others as well, uh, came up with a, with a notion that these details should not be stored, and they should not be you know, authored and stored. They should be computed as we display the picture. And for this, they define these uh, functions known as procedural textures. And here you have one of these functions, f, which takes x, y, z, this is a 3D coordinate of a point as input, and returns a color, right? And they propose the whole methodology on how to achieve this in a way that uh, calling f is actually constant in time and memory, right? So you can call it in any order you please anywhere in space. It's going to generate a consistent color field. And for instance, this nice planet is just a you know, few um, lines of code to generate these kind of things. And so that's an amazing idea. Of course, the problem is how do you write these functions f? Uh, it's tricky and you know, what expressiveness you can achieve and so on. But, but there are some very interesting results in this area. Very early on, Perlin noted that you could actually do that in a volume to have a function f that would return not a color, but would return solid or empty. And this defines a 3D, a 3D structure that, in fact, does not really exist, right? You're just displaying it from this uh, uh, function f. And so we built upon this uh, notion to propose a novel ways to generate uh, procedural forms. So why, how is this relevant to additive manufacturing? In additive manufacturing, when you produce an object, you produce it layer after layer. So let's say you want to uh, 3D print a sphere. You're going to extract one layer of the sphere. This is actually a circle. And then you can actually call this function, this procedural uh, uh, texture function, at every point of the slice to actually fill it, fill it in with details. But you only do that for the current layer that is being fabricated. And then you send it to the printer. And this has been noticed before in additive manufacturing. People have used that actually for periodic uh, um, representative elements as the ones I've showed you uh, before. And once you do that, you can generate this kind of structures. And this is one of our early results in this uh, area, where uh, this is a simulation of the object being fabricated. What's fascinating about it is that it never actually exists in the computer memory. You only get the full object once it is actually fabricated. Because at every point in time, the only thing that exists in the computer memory is one layer of this thing, and of course, the functions that compute it. If you're wondering which function this is, it's actually very simple. These are the thickened edges of a 3D Voronoi diagram, which is made out of a set of pseudo-random points. Right? It turns out that if you define it the way I, I just said, you can have a local evaluation, which means to decide whether a point in space Q is inside or outside of the structure. You only have to generate a finite a neighborhood around it of random points, locally construct the Voronoi diagram, Okay, and then evaluate where you are with respect to the edges. And this can be done uh, um, very efficiently and in parallel. And then we vary the density to change uh, the uh, properties of this foam. Okay? Um, I'm not going to uh, talk too much about manufacturing constraints, but for this particular foam, what we did is it is compatible with uh, um, additive manufacturing by construction. Why? Because uh, Voronoi diagrams have convex cells, which is good news in terms of connectivity of the structure. And also because this is an open cell foam, which means powder and so on will be able to exit, but for the very dense areas. But there's a percentage is extremely small, so like 2 or 3% of trapped material. Our recommendation is just to solidify it. And this can be done as you process through the layers. You can easily know whether a pocket is accessible or not. Okay? And then the real question is, what happens mechanically when you do this? I mean, it's just some you know, random thing you did, so why would that be good mechanically speaking? Well, the first thing we made is we looked into um, what happens if you generate different families for the same parameters of this form. What I mean by this is here in every column, we're using the same parameters for driving the uh, pseudo-random process that generates the form, okay? We, in this case, the density of, of, uh, of points, right? And so you have less dense to more dense. Now, in every column, you have two samples, and these samples are not the same. Right? They, they have been generated with different uh, random seeds initially. So the, the, their geometry is totally different. However, what they have in common are the underlying parameters of the random process. Okay? Now, we generate this, 
we put them under a mechanical machine. And what's interesting is that every family in the same column, they actually have the same or very similar elastic response. And what this means is that the elastic response here is not driven by the actual geometry. It is driven by the parameters of the underlying stochastic process. Right? So that's good news. That's what we wanted to achieve. It turns out in material science, it is, it is fairly well known in the sense that they use Voronoi diagrams and open cell Voronoi diagrams to model existing materials. Right? So there's an interesting connection between both. Now, of course, we don't do that with a mechanical machine uh, for the entire space of possibilities. That, that, would, be, that would be quite too much work. Uh, instead, we use numerical homogenization. So here's the catch is when you do uh, homogenization, you need a representative volume element. We don't have one because our thing is completely random. What we can do, however, is we can easily generate cubic samples of foams which are periodic, which is one of the constraints you need to run numerical homogenization. So then the question is, how big this sample should be? I mean, clearly, if it's very small, you're going to get one or two beams. It makes no sense, right? Uh, if it's very big, you're probably going to be fine, but then you know, this thing is a numerical optimization. It's not going to like it. Actually, very quickly, you reach uh, the boundaries of what is feasible. So we need to find the right range. And the way we do this is we uh, choose a set of parameters. We generate many, many instances. And we homogenize all of them. And we look at the spread. We get an elastic tensor every time. right? And so we look at the variance within the set of elastic tensors, which come out of homogenization. And when, when it converges to a, a small deviation, we know that uh, we're fine. Okay. And when you do this for many possibilities, you get this kind of, uh, of function. <coughs> and this is in a relative Young's modulus. It's relative to the material you're actually going to use for printing. And you have the radius and the density, radius of the beams, and the density of the foam as the other parameter. So what's interesting is that if you want to achieve one specific Young's modulus, you have a full curve to choose from. Right? So it gives you some design freedom. Uh, in fact, there is a reason you would like to use the um, uh, smallest possible beams so that you have the maximum density, because this is what will get you faster to the average behavior, right? So you, you probably want to densify uh, as opposed to anything. All right, so you do this, and then you can you know, paint objects like this with a gradient of properties. And I have this little guy here with me. Uh, why would you do a flexible octopus? I have no clue, but you know, why not? And so here it is, and you can, you can try it out uh, afterwards. Please be gentle, because this, this, this is printed on a resin printer. It's, it's a bit difficult to do, so we don't want to redo it too often. And, and the thing is, you know what you know, average elasticity you're going to get in, in every place where you paint this field. So we were happy with this early result, but in fact, we sort of fell short of what was our initial goal, because our initial goal was not to do isotropic materials, such as this one. So what do I mean by isotropic? These little foams here, made of um, Voronoi diagrams, they have the same response, whatever the direction you're uh, pressing on them, right? So they're perfectly isotropic. And of course, you can vary the density in space, but what we wanted to do is really a material that would have a response which is different in one direction than in the other. And why? Because there are well-known natural materials, such as wood, which have this kind of behaviors, and they're more optimal to respond to a specific uh, mechanical scenario than uh, isotropic materials, because they can rearrange the given material budget more optimally, if you want. Right? And so, we wanted to do this, but of course, on arbitrary orientation fields, right? So on this uh, uh, field you see at the top, we want, for instance, to be more rigid along the lines and less rigid orthogonally to the lines. So what can we do? So the first thing we did, and this is actually a known thing, is we took one of the isotropic um, uh, results and we stretched it, and then you get an isotropy. Great, problem solved. Well, not quite, because the problem is if you want to do this along an arbitrary field, you are back to having a parameterization problem, which is similar to putting cubes in arbitrary shapes. And we don't want to do that uh, because it seems too expensive. I'm not saying it doesn't make sense to do that, right? It makes perfect sense. I'm just saying that this is not the approach we choose to have. We want to have a different approach, which is more direct uh, through the procedural synthesis. The other thing we tried to do is to generate a Voronoi diagram. But this time, instead of stretching the result, we stretch the point set. And then we just do a standard Voronoi diagram. And this doesn't work. And this was quite interesting to us because it seemed to us, initially, it should have done something. But what happens is, if you look at the distribution of edges, and in particular their orientation, they're still quite all over the place, right? You still have the same distribution of angles in the edges. And so this hinted to us that probably what matters is this directionality of the edges in the result. Another thing we tried to do, we were convinced this was the actual uh, answer. Like, initially, we were almost like, OK, this is too easy, because it's enough to do that. You just thicken the beams in one direction, as opposed to the other. 
And it actually seemed to work. The problem is uh, the ratio between the thick and the thin beams would have to be so large that it's just impractical. Right? So this is not something we could do that would lead to interesting results. So instead, uh, what we ended up doing is to build um, foams from uh, what we call Kenyar's graph. So it's actually a fairly simple idea. You start with a set of points, completely uniformly, randomly distributed. And for every point, you connect the point to the k-nearest neighbors, right? As defined by some distance. And let's say we take the Euclidean distance to start, to start with. And this is going to generate a graph, such as this one, OK? Now, this one is actually isotropic. You couldn't see any difference if you rotate it. However, now you can play with the metric. And you can use a metric such as this one, which now defines an ellipse, which means it's going to artificially put points in one orientation closer to, to the others. And then you generate a graph which very visibly, in this case, has some uh, uh, orthotropy or let's say anisotropic distribution of edges. Uh, just to be a bit more precise, the way this works is we have a grid, we uh, get random points in this grid, connect the things, thicken the beams, and that's it. And of course, then the question is, what do you obtain in terms of mechanical properties? Can you verify that the orthotropy you get, because you do get orthotropy, is actually aligned with the orthotropy of your metrics, and so on and so forth? And we have analyzed all that to show that, yes, actually, it does work the way we expect it to work, right? Um, there's a cool thing about this, which is how do you know the structure will be connected? Because I built this graph from random k nearest connections, and you know, I need to know that it's going to be connected, because if I'm fabricating this, I don't want things to be dangling or, or moving around. And there's a nice uh, connection, so to speak, between this problem and problems in networks, uh, and in particular mobile phone networks, because the mobile phone antennas, that's my understanding, are connected to the k nearest other antennas to route signals through. And it's very important to them to know that these things are connected. And so it turns out there are proofs that even for small values of k, the network will be uh, very well connected. We use k equals 6, which is already way beyond uh, uh, disconnection probability. But for one thing is when you look at the proofs, they construct these things that they call the trap case. And this shows you that if you have extreme variations of point densities, you can actually end up with cases where things are disconnected. Um, fortunately, this is not something likely to appear in a mechanical uh, scenario because the driving fields tend to be smooth. Still to keep in mind, right? It could, it could potentially happen, but this is rather unlikely. Okay, and then every, all the rest is fine because this is, uh, you can evaluate it locally. So what I mean by that is you can compute one tile of this foam independently from others, and when you stitch them back, well, stitch them, you just place them side by side, they actually are going to perfectly match and you'll have a continuous result. Right, even though they were computed independently. Okay, and now we can look at the material space. So here it's uh, slightly more complicated because what we are considering, every point is a sample that we homogenized to, to see uh, how it behaves. And what you see here is the Young's modulus along the x direction and the Young's modulus along the y direction. Keeping in mind this frame can be arbitrarily rotated as you see treated, right? It doesn't have to be uh, aligned with the main axis. It can rotate. Uh, in, in, in arbitrary ways in the part. And then you have the stretch here. So keep in mind the previous method that I showed, the edges of the running diagram, this is only the diagonal. So we went from only the diagonal to covering this entire space. I'm only showing the Young's modulus. There are other things like Poisson's ratio and, um, and uh, shear uh, modulus. Uh, these ones, we don't, I mean, the behavior is uh, what you would expect uh, from an average material. It's nothing really remarkable. It's really the Young's modulus that's interesting. So if you take points here, which are, much more rigid in one direction than the other. What's interesting is that they tend to look like laminates. And it's normal because laminates are known to be optimal for this particular case of being you know, very rigid in one direction and extremely flexible in the other. And then you can explore the full space and you get a variety of things, okay? Right, and then we did things like compression tests. So we put samples under a compression machine and we test them. And there's a very interesting behavior which is I think, actually known for uh, chemical foams. Uh, here, what you see are um, several runs of testing with the machine. So the first one is a dashed line, and the last one is the line at the bottom. And you can see there's a burning behavior, which means what happens actually is the first time you test it, it's slightly more rigid, and then it becomes less, a bit less rigid, and then it stabilizes. And this is actually due to local stresses where some of the beams and connection between beams are going to rupture. And then once they're ruptured, the foam is fine, right? And this is actually known for even for chemical foams. So peop like people in the industry already using chemical foams are used to this kind of things. Now people who are expecting a nice, clean mechanical behavior, they're not going to like that. It only happens when you do large compressions, right? 
Another thing you can see is these structures are subject to buckling under compression. They're fine for extension, but in compression, you're going to see buckling. And what this means is that you have the elastic response that flattens after a while. So initially, you're in the elastic, uh, you're in the elastic uh, regime here. And then it starts to be nonlinear, but on top of it, it flattens here and drops. And this is due to buckling of the beams. Right? So buckling means you're pressing on it. Initially, it behaves nicely. And then suddenly, bam, the beams goes on the side, and the elastic response flattens. Okay. Whether it's good or bad, I mean, it's probably bad news, right? Uh, that being said, it's only in the, under large deformations, which may not be what you want when you're trying to make shapes lighter. So, you know, depends. Okay, so what can you do? You can do material design. Like, this is, a, we're, we're just trying to reproduce this super nice design by an artist. I'm not going to argue ours is, is looking better. It does not, of course, by far. Uh, but ours was super uh, cheap to do, right? It's just like two strokes. Uh, in our software, and then the foam is generated versus uh, hundreds of hours of, of modeling. Um, and uh, yes, it's small, right? I wish we could do the big one again, <laughs> but uh, our printers don't, right? Because it looks quite comfy, you see? So the way it's designed is it's going to be soft when you sit down, and, and it's going to have a nice global structure. This is not globally optimized. This is done by hand. I, I'm going to go, come back to this, OK? Here's just a close-up. It works on plates. I don't have this one, but I have this other one. And uh, you're welcome to try it afterwards. It's, it's nice because the structures here are just in 2D and then extruded. And what's nice is that they trigger a very different bending behavior, right? So here it bends easily. Here it's going to bend this way, but it doesn't want to bend this way. You can see here. And of course, it's uh, you know, like easier to press in this direction. In the middle is isotropic. I mean, you can play with it afterwards. OK, you also have this radial plate here. The idea is that this, uh, like usually a plate like this, if you press in the middle, it's going to fold. It's going to uh, do some like, high stress here at the center and fold in ways uh, you don't want. And here, when you press, it smoothly accepts the deformation thanks to the foam, which is radially distributed. OK, so how can you use the foams in design? What I showed before are actually painted things, right? designed using our foams by a designer who knows what to do with it. But the question is, could you actually combine this with topology optimization? Right? Because ideally, we want to optimize this. But instead of optimizing solid or empty, we want to optimize for parameters of the foams. Can you do it? The answer is yes, you can. And this is actually known as a two-scale topology optimization problem, which is exactly what we wanted to do initially. We want to solve globally at a cross scale. And we want to interpret or physically realize what has been optimized at a cross scale at a finer scale. Right? And so the reason it looks blurred is because the uh, topology optimizer here does not optimize for a structure, it optimizes for a composite material. The good news is that if you look at the way topology optimization is formulated, this is actually what it wants to do. So you'll get better results optimizing for a composite than optimizing for a zero one structure, so to speak. Right? And then you can interpret it uh, with the foam. The problem is you need to drive the topology optimizer such that it's aware of your material space so that you are sure that you can interpret what it does in terms of your foam. And let me show you two results. This is an ongoing work. This is a collaboration with uh, uh, Pierre Geoffroy and Grégoire Allaire at Ecole Polytechnique with my colleague uh, Jonas Martinez. And so what's interesting is here I'm comparing the first foam, the Voronoi one, to the uh, ones that can be oriented. What's interesting about it is this is a, um, a problem where you have um, two fixed points left and right. And in the middle, you have a, a charge, right, a, a weight. So it's, it's generating this uh, arc. And the one on the left is, is uh, auto-penalizing. So it tends to reproduce. The, the structure that you would obtain if you did not have a composite. And the reason is it has no way to exploit orientation or anisotropy. And so it's quite natural that it densifies in a way that is similar to a solid material. The one on the right, however, is able to exploit the orthotropy of the material space to generate a different structure that is more optimal. I don't have the number, unfortunately, here. It is like 10% more rigid, which is not like, you know, Spectacular, but 10% is still quite a big deal if you optimize for structures, right? Um, so again, work in progress, but, but I, I believe this is a, a very promising thing to, to try. OK, brief pause. We're going to talk about something related, of course, but a bit different. So we have these printers at home, right? I mean, I, three minutes, perfect. We, we don't have these super nice, fancy SLS printers. You go to a Fab Lab, and you get like these filament printers, and, and so what can we do for this? Because, of course, you can pay you know, like, uh, several thousands of uh, hundreds of euros and, and pay every part like a thousand euros. But that sounds like uh, it's going to cost you a lot to just try this. 
Um, and the bad news is that everything I talked about is, is ill-suited for filament deposition. The reason is when you cut the structures, you get circles, and as you are depositing, let's say, plastic paste, right? Like doing all these little circles, stop and stop motions, and so on, this is really bad. What works, however, is to do these kind of lines at the bottom, okay? But you have tons of problems. Like these deposited filaments, the problem is if you have nothing below, they fall, right? So you're disallowed to do these kind of shapes. Otherwise, you need support, but we're talking about a foam, so you can't clean up the support that you would add. Um, there, are, there is a limit on the maximum angle you can do. And if you're wondering what happens if you don't support things, like this is the part we tried to print without supports, and here is what comes out of the printer. That's pretty bad, even though it looks interesting. And then you have to add supports, and this is already quite a good support technique, but you have to clean that up. It takes hours and hours, and it's, it's really, really painful. So we can't do that in foams, right? So the question is, can you define a self-supporting foam? Um, and honestly, initially, when we looked at it, I was like, the answer is going to be no. But my colleagues, uh, Jonas Martinez and Samuel Ornus, came up with a super nice idea, and I'm just going to try to explain it in two minutes. So this is the basic Voronoi diagram. I could just deposit filament along its uh, uh, faces, and I would get a structure. The problem is, some of the faces here, the ones in red, cannot be printed. This is the print direction. So these roofs can't be printed, filament is going to fall. Now, what's interesting is that this is a Voronoi diagram you get if you use a Euclidean distance. You can change this distance. Actually, our colleagues in meshing, they very often use a different uh, distance, which is a square-shaped distance, and it doesn't solve the problem. I mean, the one on the left is definitely not printable either. However, if you consider the angles of the bisectors uh, of these cells, you can notice that now they're either horizontal, vertical, or 45 degrees, which means that we went from something that has angles all over the place to something that has a fixed number of angles. And it turns out that these kind of distances, you can define them as, poly as polyhedral distances. And polyhedral distances have been studied in particular. You can show that the bisectors and their angles that you're going to see in your foam depend on the shape of the input distance. And it turns out that if we use a triangle or a cone, we can prove that the diagram will have properties that makes it self-supported. That means none of the angles exceed the overhang angle, and you have nothing that would fall when you print. And that's a pretty strong thing, but you can actually enumerate all cases and see it's going to work. And what's more is that it works also when you vary the parameters of this cone. So you can generate things where the, the orthotropy in XY, so the orientation of orthotropy, density, and so on can be varied in a way that is guaranteed to always generate uh, a structure that can be 3D printed on these inexpensive printers. Right? So you can do like, you know, shoe soles like this. You can do, why not, buggy wheels. And you can also do let's say what could be a hand prosthetic, this one is filled with foam. And the, again, the cost of this object is, is like probably less than one euro, right? On a printer that costs like 300 euros. So it, it's nothing compared to the other ones, right? And it flexes and so on. And you're, you're welcome to try, to come and try it afterwards and you'll see it's quite interesting how it behaves, okay? Um, many challenges remain. I mean, uh, these are different things we tried. The one I just talked about is on the, on the right. This one is one of the early ones we did. It's really bad mechanically because it has these uh, uh, sharp boundaries. The one in the middle is something we think is quite promising because it's very progressive while being regular, which means it prints fast, reliably, and hopefully uh, is progressive. But it, you know, we still have some challenges to solve in terms of guaranteeing that it will always print properly. Right now, it's not guaranteed. Everything is on our software SSL. It's uh, freely available. You can uh, uh, download it and, and use it. Thanks to all my colleagues who did this wonderful work. Um, and uh, thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. <laughs>but at very low densities where it spikes uh, in, in a way that is undesirable, but like very low densities, probably impractical ones. So it's not really meaningful in the sense that uh, Poisson's ratio is important because you can, do, you can potentially do oxetic materials. Oxetic materials are materials with a negative Poisson's ratio. So usually 
If you take a piece of rubber, you extend it, it tends to shrink in the cross section. With an oxidic material, it's the opposite. You extend it, it mm. expands. And we can't do that at all with this material so far. Um, and the shear modulus, I don't exactly remember. It's all documented in, in the paper, but there's nothing really special about it. So they absolutely do matter, right? They do matter. Okay. What I meant is uh, our results are not particularly interesting for that. Mm -hmm. And could you actually use this uh, structure you, you built, uh, filling them with uh, gels, things like this, which would actually exhibit shear elasticity, which would be directed by the uh, 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 autotropic uh, elasticity of the structure? Right, so I think indeed uh, it's a very good point. So like what I presented is a single material print because this is a technology we have access to, to be honest. Uh, then the other thing we could do is fill it in with something else when it's an open cell foam. And these are interesting uh, suggestions. Uh, we haven't tried, so I, I really don't know what will happen, but uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for all the talk. Um, so you you showed um, a few variations of um, the Voronoi uh, um, cells uh, you would get, right. so, but you apparently you always use a Poisson point process. I mean, uh, right? Is it an issue for example? You know, they are known to have a cluster of points close together yes. and so on. So do you work yes. on the kind of distribution? So of actually, points? is that something yeah. we evaluated in this? Um, uh, first paper on the uh, Voronoi foam, so that's a good point. So the, in fact, what we do is not this, what we do is the jittered grid approach, which is a very bad approximation of a Poisson disk distribution, uh, but it's very fast, that's why we do it. Um, it turns out, in material science, they've looked at that a little bit, so if you make something more regular, let's say Poisson disk, uh, what's gonna happen is you have less uh, concentration of stresses in the structure, so maybe you are gonna lessen this uh, burning effect I was mentioning. Um, so it's really a trade-off, and, and then by being more random, it seems you are more easily, you have a better isotropy. Right? We observe that a little bit, so, but it's unclear to us because some of these results in material science papers are a bit contradictory to us, especially the one randomness versus isotropy. Uh, so we haven't looked at it uh, very thoroughly. The reason is, this notion of how you distribute the point, it's really a, 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 like, you can consider this as a black box you can exchange, right? And so there are techniques to do very fast high quality Poisson disk distribution, you could definitely plug that in and everything else works the same. Yes. Thank you. Okay. One last question. Uh, you, you talked a lot about the foam. Uh -huh. uh, do you think that uh, all these uh, theory and uh, methods can be transposed to the fiber uh, materials? Huh. So, <laughs> I don't know a lot about fibers, so I'm very, it's very hard for me to answer. I, I think it's definitely worth considering. I'd be surprised if in material science for fibers they don't have stochastic models as well. There's also an entire field known as stochastic homogenization, which looks at stochastic structures. So, I think it's, I mean, maybe there are some common points, but um, it's, it's hard to answer more precisely, sorry. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Sylvain. Okay, I think you. now it's time for the break. <laughs> <laughs>